Good morning. The last time we spoke, we talked about a series entitled Behind Enemy Lines, and we were looking at the a Hebrew people in the first installment, and they were just leaving out of Egypt, and they were following a pillar of smoke by day and a fire by night, and they were all huddled around the Ark of the Covenant because the Ark of the Covenant is what contained the presence of God. They knew that they had to be obedient to the direction that God had given them, and if they were obedient, then they would find themselves in a position of being very stable, and stability was something that they didn't have very much of since they were were at one point slaves. Now moving forward, they made it into the promised land and because they remained obedient, God ended up giving them a city by the name of Jerusalem and they for the first time were able to leave their tents. They stopped being a nomadic people and they stayed in one general area. They built a temple to God, but unfortunately after they gained that stability, they lost their obedience. And because they lost their obedience, they began to invite sin into the city. And it was only so long before that same sin filtered into the temple. Now, once that sin filtered into the temple, the Bible says that God is a jealous God. So because they decided that they were going to worship idols, God removed his presence from the temple, even though the temple was fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, what ended up happening is they fell into captivity to the Babylonians. And unfortunately, they found out the hard way that the temple was just a building if it did not have the presence of God. Because when they were under siege and the Babylonians broke into the actual city, many of them ran into the temple seeking refuge, thinking that surely God would not allow the temple, which was fearfully and wonderfully made with all of the gold and the ornaments, surely he wouldn't allow his very own temple to be taken and ransacked. But unfortunately, because the God of presence was no longer, the the presence of God was no longer there, there was no refuge within the temple. It's like in modern day society, if Someone has a million dollar ring. They got married, had a million dollar ring, but only a two dollar relationship. Well, that was the same example that was being held with the temple. It was a very beautiful building. Um, As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that when the Babylonians ransacked it, they took out more gold and brass than you could even weigh. They did not have an amount or a number they could actually associate with how much was actually stolen. So obviously the ornaments, the gold, the jewelry, it was all superficial. The most important thing was the presence of God. So they had a million dollar building with a two dollar relationship. And unfortunately, that two dollar relationship did not allow for them to be supported by God in their time of need. Um, we, We likened that to God being a strong tower. And we looked at the idea of having a a cell phone service as our strong tower. Now, are we putting ourselves in a position voluntarily where we're not under the covering of God? Do we not have cell phone coverage? in our home because we've invited idols into our home? Are we going to a church that does not have proper coverage at church because the church has become a den of thieves? These are things that we have to keep in mind because if we are deliberately putting ourselves in those situations, if we are looking at our spiritual lives and we're being driven instead of led then it may be possible that we could be driving ourselves into a situation because of our ambitions instead of being led by God, just like he did the Hebrew people when they were following the pillar of smoke by day and the fire by night. It it was uncomfortable. They didn't always know where they were going. As a matter of fact, exactly where they were headed was a mystery. But as long as they were faithful and they were obedient, 
then God was going to lead them in the right direction. Now, when they became ambitious and they wanted to drive forward on their own, they built themselves a calf. And after they built that calf, which was an idol, which he told them not to do, there was a separation. Once again, not being under God's covering. And because of that, many of them lost their lives that day. However, when we move forward, we went to the next message and the next message was about the idea of moving forward under the auspices of God and not allowing ourselves to be held back by those around us. Or in other words, we had to make sacrifice. Because when we, when we make sacrifice to God, that means we reestablish covenant. So there were two things that we needed to do. First, we need to is reestablish the covenant. The second thing we need to do is rebuild the temple. Because when we are reestablishing covenant, that means we no longer have a two dollar relationship. And if we are the temple, then we need to rededicate ourselves. And that is where the building process of the temple began. And we looked at that building process in the book of Ezra. Now, when we are building the temple, it is important that we move forward in the idea of being surrounded by those that are like minded, because if we've built ourselves up and now we we have a relationship with God once again. If we do not find ourselves equally yoked with other believers, then it's only a matter of time before we slide back in our old ways. Or in other words, if we're looking at it from the perspective of the Jewish people, they received the temple, it was fearfully and wonderfully made, and they slid into idolatry. If we know that we've already fallen out of God's favor, if it's our total relationship with God, or if we find ourselves where we're just trying to improve in a certain area of our spiritual life, this is important to put ourselves with other believers that have like-minded goals, because that's where many of us fall short. We will try our best to rebuild the temple, rebuild our relationship, and we do a good job up to a certain point. And that point usually comes when we have to cross a certain line. Now, that line is different for many of us, but I'll use a common line, which is the sacrifice of friends. If I'm rebuilding my temple and I'm reestablishing my relationship with God, however, the people that I surround myself with on a regular basis they're not trying to get any closer to God. They're not trying to hear the idea that I'm trying to get closer to God because they don't want to sacrifice the relationship that we've had or they just simply don't want to do the things that I'm doing. They don't want to come out from among other people and other things. They want to continue to do the same things that they've always done. That's fine for them. But right now I have to focus on me. So if I'm going to continue to be friends, that's OK. But I can no longer allow that person to be in my inner circle, because unfortunately, if I'm just starting out in this particular area of my life, I need to be with like minded people so that I don't go astray. There are times where that old lifestyle is going to call, going to come calling. I'm going to have memories of it. I'm going to want to. Um, proceed in the actions that I used to proceed in. And if I have someone there that's next to me that that urges me to do these things, then it's only so long before I'm going to slide back into that lifestyle. However, if I align myself with those who are equally yoked, those that want uh, to see my relationship with Christ flourish, then I will have a much harder time sliding back into those old ways. And that is what 
Ezra understood when it came to rebuilding the temple. After the temple was rebuilt, Ezra prayed. And when Ezra prayed, he prayed that the people, uh, the Jewish people would come from among the different areas and the different peoples and the different idols that they were serving. He understood that it was only so long after they built the temple that he was going to be able to maintain any type of spiritual relationship as it pertains to his people and his God. If they had remained living outside of Jerusalem, living with in, in the relationships that they, that they had built in Babylon and the surrounding areas, then they were going to eventually bring the same things with them back into the temple. Ezra had the understanding that God left the temple because of idolatrous worship. Now, they had been a people that had been exiled and in captivity for 70 years. And in that captivity, they did not have the opportunity to worship their God like they once did in the land of Jerusalem. They had been worshiping idols. They had been around idol worship. So when they came back to the temple and they rebuilt the temple and they made a covenant, that was great. But they still had to walk in the laws of God. And that's one of the thing that, things that Ezra, he, he established. He established the covenant. As a matter of fact, he made sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice according to the laws of Moses. And the reason that he did that is because he wanted diligence. He wanted the people to see that it was necessary to be very diligent and very fearful of God because that showed repentance. It showed respect. It showed loyalty. And he even went as far as to say that God had showed them more leniency and loyalty than they even deserved. So this was Ezra's way of saying we all need to come back together and leave everything that we have built and established outside of this temple. We need to leave it outside of this city because if we bring it into the city with us, then unfortunately, we're going to find ourselves back in the same position that we were just so mercifully let out of. And ultimately, that's what Ezra did. He got the people to have that same understanding. He got the people to come together and be equally yoked. As a matter of fact, he even made a decree that those that did not come within the come to the city and stay within the city for the next three days, they were going to be disinherited. Therefore, they were never going to be acknowledged as Jewish ever again. Because they were very serious about their commitment and their relationship to God. If we don't take our commitment and our relationship, our relationship seriously, then we're going to find ourselves in a backslidden lifestyle. And we're going to be making a mockery of the name of God if we continue to call ourselves by his name and we don't honor the name that we are calling on. The Bible says that God is not mocked. Now, the Bible says that we should not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. It's one of the commandments. And a lot of people take that to say that we shouldn't say, oh, my God, or or we shouldn't um, swear on the name of God. And that's very acceptable. However, look at it like this. Uh, let's just say there's a, um, a, a family, a, a husband and a wife. Uh, let's just say it's Mario and Louisa Christian. Okay. They live their lives by a Christian 
lifestyle. I mean, they, they honor God to the fullest. They hide the word of God in their hearts so they may not sin against him. Um, they are leaders in piety. They do good to those that despitefully use them. Um, they get angry, but they sin not. I mean, they check all the boxes and all the marks. And they have a son by the name of Jesus, Jesus Christian. And he, they, they raise him in the word of God. He comes up, he's obedient to the word of God. They've raised their son to be very mannerable, very polite. They've raised their son to honor God in all of his ways. Now, Jesus, he starts a business and he gets filthy rich and he still honors God. He brings God a tithe. He helps the poor. His money is just an extension of his faith. Nothing more. He doesn't believe himself to be more honorable than anyone else. He is the model example of a Christian human being. Now, there's someone at his job or, or that works for him and, and she notices him. She notices all the respect that he gets when he walks into a room. She notices his lavish lifestyle and she wants a part of that. She doesn't really care much for him, but she loves his lifestyle and she gets his attention. And one day he asks her to marry him. And she does because she loves the lifestyle. She loves the attention. But the problem is, it's only so long that she could hold up the charade of actually loving him. She never does really love him. And so now she's beginning to what he would call act out. She's beginning to wear things that are four sizes too small and five, ties, five sizes uh, too short. And she's gaining the attention of other men because she never really loved him to begin with. And she's being seen around town, around town driving other men's cars. And she's being seen with other people in different compromising situations. And she's on social media. And every time she's on social media, she's posting some inappropriate picture or when other people tell her that she's ruining the family name, she gets angry and belligerent. But they're just telling her that that's not what it means to be a Christian. The, the Christian family, they, they've lived their lives according to a certain code of ethic. They they've walked with God. They lived their lives by the, the rule of God. They raised their son, Jesus. They, they raised him to be a man of God. And now with all of her actions, she's ruining the Christian name. Now, how do we think Jesus feels if we call ourselves Christians? And we are running around serving every God but him. We're doing everything that we possibly can to live life because you only live once. But we're dishonoring the one who died to give us eternal life. This is just a small example of what it means to take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Many of us, because we refuse to live by the word of God, we refuse to live by the moral foundation that he has placed before us. And, and with, in today's society, we just really need to start with the little things. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. We can go back to the Ten Commandments. If we just did that, we would be in a better place. If we thought about all of the things that we are doing wrong in our society and we're still calling ourselves Christians. That's a problem, because just like that young lady, we are ruining the Christian name. And we need to go back to the scripture that says God is not mocked, because unfortunately, 
We have to answer for that one day. Now, my question to you is, are you going to repent and live by the laws that God had established? Are you going to find yourself in a situation where you can say, God, I'm sorry for everything that I have done. And according to your word, I'm going to turn away from it. I put down all of my allegiances. I put down all of my idols and I'm going to stand on your word and deal with the consequences that have come along with my actions. Because at some point you have to stop and turn around. That's if you're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Now, at that point, you have to make the decision for yourself on whether or not your point is going to be right here, right now, or 10 years down the road if you make it that far. The farther you make it away, the tougher it is to come back. Not necessarily because God won't accept you, but because you're going to have a lifestyle of sins to deal with, to heal from, and to answer for. So what does it mean to really be a Christian? Simply put, it's living by the word of God. And it doesn't matter if you agree with the word of God in the moment. You still need to live by it. The Bible says, by his stripes, we are already healed. Well, that's not just a physical healing. That's also a spiritual thing. We, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities and strongholds and, and rulers of darkness and spiritual weakness, weak, wickedness and high places. We have to remember that even if it's on our, at our homes or on our jobs, there may be some entities that are there that are trying to manipulate us to do the wrong things. And if we are at our homes, then we really need to to live by the word of God and God's law so that we may purify our environment. We can't invite sin into the city. We can't invite sin into our homes and expect that we're not going to be behind enemy lines. Because being behind enemy, line, enemy lines means that we are not in a safe place, spiritually, emotionally, and if you're in that environment long enough, it's going to become physical as well. On your job, we can't always control, control our environment from a physical standpoint, but what we can do is bring prayer to the workplace with us. And unfortunately, there are times where we are outnumbered and overruled and seemingly overrun because we're getting mocked or teased and that can be on the job, um, that can be at home, that could be in the street, you can, wh wherever you are, that can happen to you. But please understand that you are not the first person that it happened to. I mean, if we just look at the Bible, uh, Noah got mocked for 120 years while he was creating the ark. But wasn't nobody laughing when the water started to rise. If we think about Jesus, Jesus was on the cross being laughed at, being mocked. But people stopped laughing when the temple was rent in two and uh, the dead began to walk the streets. No one was laughing anymore. What the mockers did not understand was that the entire time, God always had control and those that were acting on God's behalf maintained spiritual authority, even though they seemed they were in the weaker place or weaker positions. We have to understand that even though we as Christians, sometimes it may seem that we are getting the worst end of things. 
we still have to live by the law that God has provided for us so we can maintain our status in his kingdom. And he always has the power of authority. And if we are in Christ, that means we are joint heirs to the throne. And if Jesus is on the right hand of the father and he has all power, then guess what? We are sitting right beside Jesus as joint heirs. And we too are beneficiaries of Jesus having all power. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your mercy, most of all. And Heavenly Father, we just ask that as we move forward, that we would keep you in the forefront of our minds, that we would not allow ourselves to be overrun by the enemy. We ask that we would not invite sin into the city, that we would not invite sin into our households, and that we would maintain a presence, uh, maintain your presence in our lives, in our homes. We ask that we would keep your law. We ask that we begin to read more of your word so we can have a better understanding of your word and what it means to be a Christian. We ask that we would minimize the desecration of your name. We ask that we will repent um, aloud when we have sinned against you. And it's not for public notoriety, but it's simply for the idea of us not wanting to massacre or desecrate your name. If we are going to be um, called by your name, then Heavenly Father, we just want to make sure that we live the lifestyle that is necessary to be able to be called by your name. Heavenly Father, we just pray for those right now that are, are sick. We pray for those um, that are emotionally in, drained. We pray for those that are physically drained. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are suffering attacks on their mind right now in the name of Jesus. Um, we know that no weapon formed against them shall prosper as long as we are under your covering and under your auspices. So, Heavenly Father, right now we give you jurisdiction and authority over our lives. We ask that you will lead us, guide us and, and protect us. We ask that we would um, only be driven where you lead us to be driven. We ask that we would follow your guidance and your leadership. And we ask that you will continue to strengthen us. Your word says that your joy is our strength. So right now, in the name of Jesus, we are praying that we are sacrificing daily so that we may bring you joy, which in return is going to strengthen us for the road that you have prepared ahead. Heavenly Father, we pray. Um, we know that this road is not going to be easy, but Heavenly Father, we know that you said in your word that your your burden, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So right now, in the name of Jesus, we ask that we would see things the way that you see them, not through our eyes, because that easiness and that lightness is not always easy to understand from the eyes that we have because we have been tainted by this world and this society. So we just ask that moving forward, you will give us a better understanding of your word, of your wisdom. And we ask that we will have more knowledge so that we may fight the good fight of faith. And we ask all of these blessings in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. And as always, stay safe, stay informed, but most of all, stay in prayer. God bless.